documentary photographer, I am an illustrator and I run workshops and I often hold exhibitions but normally when it's not um, in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> in my spare time though, I'm a member of Young Producers um, which is a collective of artists uh, living in and around Nottingham and we are supported and funded uh, by City Arts and we all come together to do various projects working with the members of the community and we put on this lovely festival every year. We're having to go digital this year as you might be able to tell. So this is our first attempt at a few uh, online workshops um, so I hope you enjoy. The festival this year is called Remain, Regain and Retrain and as part of that we wanted to share a few skills that might help you in going forward and that some of our members might have to offer. So as part of that I've decided to share a little introduction to photography. Now this isn't anything very advanced, it's all quite beginner, you know, basic stuff that you kind of need to know if you're planning to sort of pick up your camera or your phone and just give it a bit of a go. I'm going to run through a few different things today. I'm going to start off with the equipment you need, which isn't as much as you might think. Um, it's all very affordable and very accessible, which is something that I like to always make sure in, in the workshops that I'm running. Um, I'm also going to go through the basics that you need to know about photography. And this will apply to any you know, medium of camera that you use, whether it's on your phone, whether it's a film camera, whether it's an SLR camera, whatever level of kit you've got. You know, even if it's just a um, point and shoot disposable camera that you've bought from uh, you know, Boots, then it, it's quite easy to apply these principles to any kind of photography. After that, I'm going to go through a few ideas of how you can then, you know, use these new skills um, around the home because, let's face it, we're all going to be stuck in for a little while. We're all kind of been in this lockdown and for many of us, including us in Nottinghamshire, it's not really changing too much. We're still spending a lot of time around the home. So as part of that, I thought I'd run through a few little ideas that you can do at home to sort of have a little bit of fun with photography, but also a few that might actually help you in maybe your own art practices or your own businesses or, you know, your own sort of um, career at home. So hopefully this is quite useful. So I'm going to start by discussing the equipment that you can use. I think when you first mention photography, it can put a lot of people off, myself included, when you start hearing about the cost of everything. Things can add up very quickly and before you know it, even just looking at a camera, you know, you can be looking at multiples of 100 before you've even started. And, you know, that's without any of the other kit. But I think one of the things that people don't realise is that you can take an amazing photograph with totally you know, affordable kit. And you can also take terrible photographs with the most expensive kit that exists. So really, it's not about the type of equipment you have or can afford, it's about what you do with it. So if you can afford, you know, a, a, a film camera that you just send off and you, you get the pictures back for eight quid disposable, there's still things you can do with that. Even though you can't control it in the seconds, you can still have the control over, you know, the visual impact and the aesthetic of it, which is still a skill in itself. Beyond that, if you start to look at your phones, then most of us have a phone and they all come with amazing cameras nowadays. But if you know the right apps to download and you know how to manage your camera settings on your phone, then most cameras can actually do the basics of photography that I'm going to run through today. So this workshop should be helpful if you have equipment of, of sort of any varying level of equipment that you may have. Let's start with the SLR camera. This is the single lens reflex camera and it's what most professional photographers will use um, and it uses a mirror 
um, in fact, often it uses two mirrors to um, bounce back the light so you see it through the viewfinder. So what is good about these cameras is that you are seeing directly through the viewfinder, you are seeing the exact image that will be taken with the camera. Digital cameras, you are often seeing a digital image, which is why a lot of photographers and people who want to take more professional images tend to turn to an SLR. There are other types of professional camera that you can venture into, but I don't want to get caught up in that today. Now, I know some of you might have an SLR, but you don't really know how to manage the settings on it. And it's quite a common thing for people to switch it onto auto and um, just, you know, snap away like that. And that's great. It's great when you first get a camera so you can get used to it, but it will limit eventually what you can actually achieve. So if you find yourself in low lighting or it's dark or, you know, you need to take a really fast moving subject and, you know, you're only on these auto settings and what you'll find is in the low light and the dark light, it won't come out and you'll be really limited by your camera's auto settings. And if you're trying to capture a fast subject and you're stuck on auto, then it will come out as a blur. And you'll, some, you'll find that the more you get into photography, the more you're limited. And by using the manual settings rather than the automatic settings on your SLR, you'll suddenly find that you have a much more control and that you're able to sort of capture everything that you want to rather than just hoping when you press the shutter. that not everyone will be able to have an SLR or be able to afford one easily. So it's interesting and important to know that you can actually do these settings on your phone itself. So some app, there's a few apps that I would recommend downloading if you have Android or an iPhone. One of them is Snapseed and another one is Pro Camera. Now, Pro Camera is absolutely amazing at replicating the settings on an SLR. If you download the Pro Camera app, I think it is $1.99 or something like that, and I think there's a free version as well. But if you download that, then you'll find that if you start using that instead of your phone's camera, then you can do all the settings that you can do in an SLR. You can change the aperture, you can change the shutter speed, you can change the exposure, you can, you, can, you can alter everything so that you can get professional photographs. I use it a lot when I don't have my SLR on me. If I happen to be walking around and I see something that I really like the look of, then I will often switch to my phone and, and use that to capture something in, in the place of my SLR. Or say I've got my SLR on me and I don't have the right lens, then it's a really great opportunity. The other app that I've asked you to download is um, Snapseed is just one of many editing apps that are really good. A lot of people turn to um, Photoshop apps, which are great if you can afford them. Um, I have them because I need it in my professional practice. But if you aren't going to use it that much, then it's not. I, I would more recommend these um, more affordable apps to start editing on. And on Snapseed, you can edit most things. You can change the lighting, you can change the um, sharpness, but I'll go into all that in more detail. Now, some phones already have all these settings inbuilt into them. You've just got to click through the camera and find them. I find the apps um, work well for me, but I know that some people prefer to change their actual phone settings. So my point is, before you decide to invest in an expensive camera sometimes it can actually be better to learn the skills with your phone or with a cheap alternative and then upgrade to the expensive camera when you know a bit more what you might be doing so and the main point from that of course is that anyone can give it a go there shouldn't be any barriers to, to people accessing this basics of photography. 
We're going to start with the aperture, which is the amount of light that you let into the camera, the shutter of a camera. It can be open and it, that would be quite a large aperture and let in quite a lot of light. Whereas if it was closed, it would be quite a small aperture and let in much less light. Now, to make it more confusing, we call these, uh, the measurements of measuring aperture, we call them f-stops. So if you pick up your SLR camera or your iPhone and you can move the aperture up and down, you'll find that you are able to alter that quite easy. On a SLR, you will need to be able to put your camera into manual mode and on your phone, you will either need to use the Pro Camera app or you will need to find the settings in your iPhone, but you should be able to change the aperture number and it will come up as F3.5, F7.5 and you'll be able to move it up and down depending on how much your phone or your camera can do. A small number like f3.5 means that the hole is very much open. That, that shutter in your camera is wide open right now to let in as much light as possible. This means that you'd want to use a low number like f3.5 with which will give you a large hole of your camera and it will let in as much light as possible. Now, this is great to use if it's a less bright day, if you're in a dark setting, or if you particularly want to produce um, some effect. It's often used a lot in um, portraiture. This kind of um, information is really the key to photography. You need to know what your aperture is. Now, aperture only works effectively because you have to use it alongside shutter speed and ISO, to name a few. Now, shutter speed is that same hole. So you might have your aperture wide open. Now, shutter speed is how fast the picture is taken. So you've got that wide open hole. Now you can take the picture really slowly. And if it's taken slowly, then it's going to let more light in. But if it's taken really fast, then it's going to let much less light in. And so we measure our shutter speeds in seconds. So a really, really slow shutter speed might be one tenth of a second. Whereas a really sort of average shutter speed, you would have it on about a hundredth of a second. And you can go all the way up to a thousandth of a second. Now, if you take a really, really slow shutter speed at a quarter of a second, then what you'll find is if you were handholding your camera or your phone, your arms will move. Even if you hold it as still as you can, it will, it will shudder and tremble. And most likely what you're capturing will move and it will come out in a blur. So if you're shooting at those sort of speeds, then you need to have it attached to a tripod. And this is the same for your phone as well. So you would need to prop it up with a book or prop it up against something. Or, you know, if you can, get a, get a phone tripod or a camera tripod and use that to to manage your shutter speed and to make sure that you reduce the, the camera shake on your phone and your camera. Um, but a really, really fast shutter speed is really easy to handheld. There will be absolutely no shake on that at all, whether it's your phone. So if you take something at a thousandth of a second, there will be absolutely no camera shake and everything will come out crisp and clear and there will be no blur whatsoever. So you've got to weigh up these decisions. The other thing is, if you take it out at a faster shutter speed, at a thousandth of a second, say, 
you're letting in much less light so your image will come out really dark if you let it out at you know a really slow shutter speed at say um, a tenth of a second then you're not you, you're letting in loads and loads of light now the problem with this is that aperture and shutter speed work together as you can see they both control the amount of light aperture controls the amount of light that will come in so it could be small or it could be big and shutter speed controls the amount of light whether how fast it is and how slow it is so you've got to use these in partnership to control the light levels and it's only through matching up the correct aperture and the correct shutter speed that you can then find the balance between the right exposure which is then what you want to see have a really slow shutter speed and a very small number aperture which if you remember will give you a very wide hole then what you'll find is your picture will be massively overexposed because you will be just letting in too much light depending on where you're shooting maybe if you're shooting in the dark at night maybe you need that much light but if you're shooting in the middle of daylight in a field then you'll find that your picture will be overexposed and you'll know it I'll go into that in a bit more detail later but you'll know it will be overexposed because it will be flooded with white the same can happen for it to be underexposed so if you don't let enough light in if you have a too fast a shutter speed say a thousandth of a second and then you have you know too small an aperture, too big a number, um, say, you know, f9, then you're not going to let enough light in at all. And what's going to happen is when you look at that photograph after you've taken it, whether this be film, digital, whatever, it's going to be too dark, unless those were the settings you want. Unless you are in bright sunlight and you are trying to reduce the amount of light you let in as much as you can because there is so much light. And so you, you really have to react to the situations you're in. And all the time when you're taking your picture, you've got to think about how much light there is and how much that is going to affect what picture comes out. So the final component in this sort of triangle that you need to think about is your ISO. Now, the, the, the lower your ISO, the better the quality your pictures will be. So what we want, ideally, is to be shooting in the lowest ISO possible. Again, you can change these settings on your phone, in the app, or on your SLR, in the manual setting. Now, what you'll find when you do an ISO is um, most ISOs will start with 100. And that's, you know, kind of a good starting point but um, I can some, I can shoot around 400 as well generally and what it does is the higher your ISO is so you know I think one of my cameras goes up to 3200 and then you can get other cameras that go up to 24,000 and beyond so they go up to all sorts of numbers depending what camera you're using the higher the ISO the more light you can let in but generally, you wouldn't mess with the ISO, you would want it as low as it can be. Now, the only reason you would change your ISO is, say you've set your aperture to the absolute, you know, lowest it can be, and you've set your, and, and you know, the aperture's at its widest point, and you've yet set your shutter speed to the fastest it can be without you losing all the light. And yet, you know, your picture's still dark, the, the, the exposure is not right. And then what you'd do is you'd move your ISO up. Now, your ISO will affect the light that's coming into your picture. So you'll suddenly find that your picture gets brighter, and in turn you have to change your aperture and your shutter speed again. So they, they all affect each other. The higher the ISO, 
the more light will be let into your picture. The lower the ISO, the less light will be let into your picture. But the higher you put the ISO, it comes with a cost. It reduces the quality and increases the pixelation, the, the specs and the um, rust that might appear in, in your picture and it increases the chance that, you know, when you look at a photo and you can see that it's it's a little bit, um, it's really when you zoom in and you can see that the, the quality is sort of um, dipping a little bit and it's because that picture now can only be used for certain size printing. So the higher you go at the ISO, the more it reduces the picture and the more the more that it does that is, say you wanted to print your picture off really big, you wouldn't be able to, you'd print it off and your picture would come out pixelated because you've lost the quality. Whereas the lower you keep the ISO, the bigger you would be able to print your picture. Now, I just want to add another thing, which is when you're shooting, um, I would always recommend that if you're using an SLR, shooting raw, always shoot in raw, because then you can process your pictures and you can process them into JPEG or TIFF. Now, I'm talking about file um, types at the moment, but it's something that's quite important to know because if you store files on your computer as JPEGs, they do deteriorate over time. So it's best to store your files as TIFFs or RAWs and always keep the original files. So there's even an option on your phone. On your phone, you can switch a switch in your settings and it gives you the option to keep the original files or to keep a copy always keep the original files as well as the copy because that's what's got all the information and all the detail that you need so if you do ever want to print them out you do ever want to use them and you want them to stand the test of time digitally then that's the way um to be that's just a little um side note to add in so now we've got this triangle of aperture shutter speed iso and you can see that they all interact with each other so you know, if you reduce the aperture number, which will open it wide, then you've got to have kind of a fast shutter speed to make up for that. But if you want to take a really, you know, slow shutter speed, then you've really got to think about letting a lot of light in with your aperture. So it's kind of important to, to that, that, that they kind of balance. Um, and, and ideally, you would only use your ISO if you needed it in, in low lighting, so on a cloudy day, in a dark room, that kind of thing. Um, and those three together, the aperture at the top, the shutter speed there and the ice, they all interact together. So you've got to bear them all in mind when you use them. And this will um, produce your exposure. So this will control, how all three of these control how much light is let in. And the most important thing in photography is how much it's created by light bouncing off of mirrors. and. The most important thing is to control how you, much light is coming into your picture and that is what will make the difference between having a well photographed sort of observation and, and having something that looks less professional and it's also the difference that the automatic mode can't do for you. It can attempt it but it can't change those little nuances that really make a great picture. So it's all about really getting it right in camera. Just to go over it again, that if your exposure is touched slightly off, the most important thing about photography is knowing why and knowing how to fix it. So if something is overexposed, then you'll find that when you look at your picture after you've taken it, there'll be lots of white. You won't be able to make all the details. Maybe the background's white. You know, maybe the face is overexposed. And it, that means that too much light is letting in. And what you've got to try and do is to make it so there's less light coming in and that means you know upping your aperture number you know and that means upping your um shutter speed so that less light comes in um so it's about sort of you know responding the other thing about um if something's overexposed is it's really really hard to put right out of camera now with my business I don't do editing out of camera but I'm there are times when you might need to um, fix something like that which is where um, uh, Snapseed comes in if you want to use an app on your phone for editing um, 
and that's the kind of thing that you could fix but it's always better to take a darker picture because then it will have the details recorded and then you will be able to edit the um, lighting to lighten it up but you can't make something darker that is too light so if in doubt shoot darker and try and get it underexposed more than overexposed but ideally once you've had a bit of a play and you know what you're doing you know you're just trying to get that perfect exposure and you will learn what makes that perfect exposure the more you play with it the more you start to learn oh yeah that that f number and 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 that shutter speed go really well together and you know that's really good for this type of photography and you'll you'll start to know when you're out and about and you'll start to notice the light levels and you'll know what will work best Underexposed is obviously when it's too dark, and again, this is this. If, if you had to choose one of the, you know, bad of the bunch, then the best thing is for something to be um, underexposed because then it's going to um, have uh, not letting as quite as much light, but it will it will have a lot more um, a lot more detail. Um, shutter speed and ISO is that these can all interact and create various effects one of these is depth of field now you can even see it with me talking to you now notice how the closer I get to this camera the more in focus I am and the more completely out of focus and sort of bucket you've probably seen this effect quite a lot I mean it's particularly come apparent in the iPhones um, new uh, portrait mode but it's also um, used a lot in professional photography so um, if you wanted it to be really really blurry um, in the background then you would use a small depth of field and to achieve that you need a small aperture number the smaller your aperture number so say f3 f3.5 say the smaller your aperture number the larger the hole remember then the smaller the depth of field will be which right, like right now the background will be blurry so the only thing in focus will be what you were focused on the um if you want a, a large depth of field which means that everything behind you is very much in focus then what you'll need is to have a really high aperture number so like say f9 and then all of the background behind me, all of this, will be completely in focus. But you've got to remember to match it up with a, with a slower shutter speed to get your light levels right. So you can use the aperture and the shutter speed and the ISO to play around with um, changing the depth of field, which can change the appearance of a photograph. And it also, you know, depend, if I'm doing a big group shot, it's no good just having the person in the middle in focus and everyone else blurry. So I would need a, a wide depth of field to be able to capture everyone in it and not have them blurry. Whereas if I'm focusing on one flower in the middle of a picture, I want just that one flower in focus and the rest behind it totally out of focus. So I'd use a very small aperture number, which again, if you remember, is a very, very large hole that a lot of light in. Um, so remember um, this is particularly important with SLR cameras but I, you know I also find a lot of people need to know this about um, phones is it's so important to remember to focus it you know if you're on your phone just remember to touch it and, and, and focus it before you take the picture because it's just something that people forget and it makes such a difference where you put that focus in your picture can really make or break a photograph You've got to think of your um, your picture as broken into a grid of nine. And you've got to think about where you put that focus. This is the rule of thirds, and it's one of the things where it's so important where you put the focus in the picture, because that is where the eye of the person looking at the photograph is drawn to, and that is what's going to tell your story. So before you take a picture, you've got to think, A, what you want to focus on, and B, where you want the focus to be. And C, to make sure you actually focus it. Now on a phone, this is mostly just touching it. And especially on the um, pro camera app, you just touch it and it'll, it'll, it'll work itself out. It'll be focused. Now on an SLR camera, there are two types of focus. There's manual focus and there's automatic focus. The automatic focus will do half the job for you. 
so you will point it and um, it will it will focus itself you can use the settings in your camera to um, uh, put in focus points which means that you can select in camera where you focus on which is a little bit more technical but can focus your camera a little bit more now there is the option and I'm talking about on the camera lens right now there's when you look at your camera lens on your SLR there will be an option for automatic or manual or you know if you've got an older camera a film camera it'll just be manual now it's really important that when you hold the camera up and it's on manual mode and your lens is on manual that you actually focus it now that involves looking through the viewfinder and you know twisting the lens until it becomes in focus the image in your viewfinder now a good way to do this is if you have a lens with any sort of zoom on it is to zoom in because you can really see the detail of whether what you're trying to focus on is focus is in focus but it's just so important to focus your camera because otherwise all your pictures will come out out of focus blurry and you won't even be able to make out what the pictures are and that would be the most disappointing thing so do remember to focus your camera about uh, lighting this is sitting in a rapidly darkening room but lighting is really important if I was to do photography in this room right now I wouldn't have much hope it's really important to um, uh, photograph in a um, light area um, I recommend daylight um, the most um, you can get studio lighting you can use um, uh, artificial lighting but I prefer to use daylight now it's important to think about the angle that the light is coming from so right now my window is over there so the light is coming on my face here and this side is in darkness similarly when you take a photograph you've got to think well is this where I want the light or you know do I want the light that side and if you want it that side you've then got to manipulate things so that your subject or you are in the right position to take that photograph and it will it'll change the effect. Now you can also do this with artificial lighting. So, you know, if I put the um, light on right now, you can see that the lighting is now changed dramatically and I'm lit in a completely different place from above. Um, so it's really important to sort of um, pay attention to the shadows and pay attention to how they are um, affecting um, how you appear um, in your photograph. Um, so that's something to think about when you take the photograph and especially if you're outdoors or indoors you've really got to think about where the sun is and where the light's coming from because the other side of that will be shadows and if you want to reduce the light maybe some artificial lighting is your way to go but I prefer not to use artificial lighting um, I actually prefer to um, just use my camera and something that I'm quite passionate about is um, telling people to you know turn off their flash I found with a lot of people, whether it's cameras, SLR, whatever it is, they want to use the flash. You know, even point and shoot, they want to use the, they want to use the flash that comes with the camera. And what that will do is often it will just wipe out, you know, your whole image. And suddenly your whole image is filled with this burst of light and it looks unnatural. And it makes your photograph look less professional. Now flash can be used really well, but the flash that can be used well is often never the flash that comes with the camera. Most images that most you know professional photographers that use flash will use a flash gun rather than the one that comes with a camera. So what I would recommend, particularly for people just starting out, is to just use your camera and forget about the flash. You know, alter those light even on your phone. Alter those light. Alter those um, settings on your phone. You know, alter your aperture, shutter speed, your ISO, and use that to make your image more light or more dark. You know, don't introduce a flash. And, you know, if you really have to, use a bit of artificial lighting or, you know, point, have the flash that is off your camera and hold it away. Um, I've used a uh, flash only, I've used my external flash only a couple of times and I've used it in particularly dark environments. Um, and even then I've tried to use it few and far between. So I'm not, I'm not a lover of flash. Some photographers are. But I would always say that it's very important to, um, especially like the phone flash, you know, try and avoid it where you can. 
um, I don't want to get too complicated and put you off, but there's also uh, um, light metering, um, which you can do in your in your camera, which will help you, um, you know, monitor the light levels that are, are coming in. Um, when you take a photograph, um, you can get this on your phone and you can get this in your SLR, it'll come up with a histogram. Now that histogram uh, will show you whether your picture is too light or too dark and you can alter your settings accordingly to try and accommodate that. Um, so that's another thing that's really important to check. Now obviously with cameras you can, um, you know, SLR cameras particularly, and actually you can get it for, uh, for phones too, you can get lenses. So you can get um, macro lenses, which will help you do, you know, close up or portrait to work. You can get zoom lenses, which are brilliant for animal work or, you know, um, close ups of, of things far away. But you can't, you can't shoot close up. So I can't, if I had a, if I had a zoom lens, I can't shoot, you know, between me and, and you, that would be too close. So you can only shoot things that are further away. Um, you can also get um, fisheye lenses, which is where it makes me look like I'm in some sort of a, a bubble. Um, there's all sorts of lenses that you can get to do different tips and tricks. And you know, if you really want to get into it, you can get filters, which change the light colours and change the um, appearance. Um, one more. <music> one more thing that I'd say is important to pay attention on both your phone and your SLR is the white balance. So, the white balance, um, you can have set automatically, but if you want the ultimate control on both your phone and on your SLR, then you can change it. Now, what that will change is um, essentially how white is appearing. So, you see this room I'm in right now is appearing really yellow, and like, you know, a horrible indoor light. And you can change your white balance so that it will change... Um, the settings and allow um, a more crisp white to come into the room. Same if you're getting like blue tones, you don't want that. You want, you know, you want pure white, yeah. So you can change all your settings to accommodate that with your white balance. Um, so, you know, before before you, um, you look at your image and think, oh, why isn't this working out? There's always a way to fix it that you can sort of um, acknowledge in, in those settings. Thirds, which is uh, thinking of your image as split into three. Now, you know, me being here is quite a good image, me being here is quite a good image, but me being all the way over here, oh, it looks a bit weird. And that's the thing, you've got to sort of try and think about, you know, how your image is broken up. And um, something that I find really helpful is I actually decide what image I'm going to take before I even pick up the camera. So I'm not holding the camera and looking through it and thinking, Oh, what should I take? What should I take? I'm looking, you know, my eye, in your way, your eyes are the most important thing here. I, so, you know, I can walk down the street and see pictures to take without even having my camera on. And it, it, the more you do it, the more you get into that sort of headspace. But it's actually deciding what you want to photograph, you know, before you've even picked up the camera and sort of visualising that framing. Um, something else I find quite useful is to not always photograph the obvious shot. So, you know, you might want to get in close to things, you might want to get far away from things, you might want to take it from an upside down angle. You know, it's just about looking at something differently. You could take, you know, 40 different shots of the most mundane item from different angles, different perspectives, you know, get high, get low, you know. You know, try try various different, um, you know, viewpoints and uh, try, get, you know, try different effects, get, try it with a, with a, with a shallow depth of field, try it with a, with a wide depth of field, and it's all about, you know, just trying those different settings and having a go. Um, I, I want to touch on editing a little bit, so you can do that on the Snapseed app, you can do it on Photoshop, you can do it on, um, uh, many, many programs, I also use Lightroom to, um, sort out my catalogue of photographs, because I end up with a lot. Um, but one of the things about editing is, you know, don't over edit, there's no need. You know, if you've done all the stuff that we've been through already, then you're going to have a perfect picture in camera. So what do you really need to do? The only thing you might need to do is occasionally, you know, if you've got the exposure slightly wrong, you might be able to save those photos. 
you know, you can alter the brightness, you can alter the contrast, you can alter the sharpness, you might want to crop it. And I'd say really that's about, you know, you might, you might want to add a few blacks in, a few whites in. You could do that all, all on Snapseed, you know, all on um, Photoshop, depending if you want to pay or not pay. You know, there's free apps to do this and you can manage all those settings manually. You know, I think you can even do it in, your, in my iPhone now. You can do it on most phones. And it's those sort of settings that you want to be looking at and less at the filters. You know, you don't want to be messing around with, um, with the you know, various filters you can get or whatever. You want to be changing these settings because this is the stuff that's really going to, you know, fix your photo and, and not have it looking non-professional or, or, you know, less quality. Um, the other thing is, as I say, you know, always make sure you save your image to the highest file size that you can. And always make sure that you save your original files. And if you're shooting in camera, you want to save it in RAW and then export it in um, JPEG. Um, now, if you're looking at photographs, you'll find that you'll see a lot of colour and a lot of black and white photographs. Always, 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 unless you're using, you know, old film camera that can only shoot in black and white, you know, because it's literally film, always shoot in colour. And then you've got your original and you can alter it to black and white later. Now I don't really like working in black and white, I prefer to keep my images as I say as they are in camera but if you want to you can use black and white really effectively, you can use it to set mood, you can use it to you know, set tone, you can really use it to highlight patterns and, and, and features in your image so it is something that you could explore. Now I've sort of gone through the basics of photography and the sort of technical stuff that you kind of need to know and you know, a lot of photographers get bogged down in that stuff and sometimes it's the, um, you know, learning and the aesthetic and the visual of it that's, you know, equally important. So now I want to get on to more of that stuff and, you know, it's time to, to have some of the fun stuff, really. Um, so now we've sort of learned, you know, what to do or not to do, I want to give you a few little um, ways you can sort of try that at home and, you know, it'll be quite fun. To be honest, we're all sort of um, stuck at home at the moment, or, you know, we're definitely spending more time in our houses than we were thanks to lockdown and the pandemic and, you know, just the whole of this year. So I think it's quite important to realise that photography isn't something that you have to do, you know, just when you're on a day trip or just when you're on holiday, you know. You can literally capture your everyday life, you can capture the things around you. It doesn't have to be what you might... Um, think is interesting you know you can capture the most mundane details and they might be interesting to someone else or you've caught a unique perspective of something and I think it's always important to remember that um that actually you know just being in your very house there's a lot of things that you could you know happily photograph so I'm going to run through a few little um photography at home ideas and a few little things that you can um get on with uh, from the comfort of your own home um and uh, that are particularly might be relevant to this year and um, are doable for, um, uh, you know, people just getting started in photography. So the first one that I want to look at is product photography. Now this might be particularly useful for people who are artists or makers or, you know, maybe maybe you sell items, you know, in a shop or, you know, maybe you've got, I don't know, something you really want to photograph. That's a still object. And this is really important. Um, and I think a lot of people think you need expensive equipment for this. And uh, you don't. As I said earlier, the best thing to use is daylight. And the best thing to do is to make sure, you know, like I had earlier, you've got lots of uh, window light and that you're shooting at the right times of day. It's best to shoot um, sort of when the when the light is not too bright, but you know not too dark as it went earlier. Um, so uh, late afternoon, you know, late morning, they're sort of the the general best times throughout the year. Um, you want it, you know, not dark, not light, not too light. So it's just about timing that um, perfectly. Now, product photography can be really. Um, Simple and it's it's not something that I find particularly natural. I don't. I'm 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 not um I'm not very confident at product photography, but it's something that everyone can do. 
Now, um, you can use um, a lot of makeshift backgrounds. So, easy things that I've been using for years um, in both product and studio photography is a sheep sort of pegged up or hung up, um, uh, you know, across the wall. You can change a colour wall in an instant with that. You can have a white background in a room where there's nothing else white with that, you know. It's really useful, um, you know, just scrap material, you know. And then for the um, actual um, uh, ground level that you want to lay the object on, then I find things like coloured paper, felt, material, you know, all things that you can access really easily. Um, and then one of the best things is to have um, lots of props to um, sort of enhance your 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 product that you're going to take and the, uh, that, that you can sort of scatter around or, or lay out in organised lines and the best thing to do is to get down to the level of the product um, a lot of people want to stand and look down one of the key things about photography is getting really low and um, you know getting to the level of your subject I mean that's important in in whatever you photograph you know if you're photographing small children you need to be at their level you know not looking down on them because it will change the perspective of the photograph um, and it's also um, what works really well with a lot of product photography is using that um, you know small depth of field having that um, that that shallow depth of field and having that um, that very um, blurred background so that you're just focusing on the item that you want to see and you've got you know a few so it's really important where you focus your camera and you know making sure you get that nice depth of field you don't have to but it can really um depending on what effect you're after it can be really useful obviously if you're doing a group shot with various items you'd need it all in focus so it's just about weighing up those um technical aspects once you've got those basics you can basically apply it to any sort of photography but you know something that's really fun to photograph at home is just products you know give it a go and you don't sell products and you just want to do it, you know, just, you know, take a book off a shelf, get a piece of jewellery that you own, you know, pick up a cushion and just start laying it with background and photographing it, get a vase of flowers, you know. You can do it with still life too, there's a lot of um, studio portraits you can do and as I say, you don't need expensive lights, you can use daylight if you want to, you can, but, um, you know, I've always preferred to use um, daylight against um, any backgrounds that I use um, and, Something that can be really helpful if you, is if you are um, going to photograph a product or a still life, you know, is um, depending, you know, it's quite important to have the item uh, far, further away from the background. The further it is from the background, the more you're going to get that clean, nice, crisp um, background in your in your in your photograph, um, and uh, you know, especially if you're using a shallow depth of field. So that's something that I'd recommend is to have your items as further away, you know, as you can. Um, obviously, realistically. Um, in terms of a studio setup, you can also use that big background of the sheet and, uh, you know, your coloured paper or, you know, your felt or your, your sheet or your material or whatever. And you can do things with, um, with portraiture with that as well. So you can do portraiture at home. So, you know, if you've got a, you know, willing family member who, um, you know, is twiddling the thumbs, you can ask them politely to, um, you know, step in front of a, a sheet that you've got hung up and you can easily take portrait pictures. You know, it's always best to um, be near a window and make sure there's a lot of light and make sure it's a side that you would like the light to be on because that can change things. Um, think about where your shadows are going to go. And again, try and not be too near the background because, you know, then it'll become clear it's a background. <laughs> And you know your depth of field will be too wide, so you won't you won't you won't get that distinction from the background. Um, you know, try and think about what clothes you're going to be wearing and accessories and things, so that it um, makes your picture sort of stand out and have the um, the impact that you really want. And um, you can obviously also do this with yourself. So try out with yourself in front of backgrounds and you know various fashions and clothes. And again, it's better to be close to the camera and further away from the backdrop, I'd say, for beginners to do this type of studio photography. Um, so, um, another type of photography that you can do at home is macro or close-up photography. Now, this is something that I really do absolutely love. It's something I do a lot of 
if you go on my social media you'll see it everywhere it's something I really like I sell you know a lot of cards of flowers and close-ups and um, I really like doing this because it's more like documentary photography the stuff I was talking about before was studio and product photography and that's all about placing something somewhere and you know setting it up and you know choosing and controlling how something is documentary photography is just about capturing what's there so you don't move it you don't disturb it you're just taking a picture of it as it is now you can manipulate that you might get really close up or really far away or you know you can change the depth of field you can get shallow depth of field or wide depth of field so it's more blurry in the background or everything's in focus you can get you know high up from the ground you can get low up from the ground you can change the perspective you can change the angle you can change the lighting there's so much you can control but essentially you are capturing exactly what is there now this is something really fun to do about the home so you can um, you can you know explore your home and find things that might be interested to, to photograph maybe there's a nice pattern somewhere you know maybe there's something that might be mundane to you but you know in a few years time maybe you won't remember it maybe you need to capture it and keep those memories maybe it's something you know so mundane that it makes it interesting to you or to others you know you can you can you know capture door handles you can capture um you know keepsakes you can just walk around your home and just get up close to things and just shoot things in immense detail you know you can do that with an iphone you can even get macro lenses for your iphone for like you know a quid on amazon that can really enhance that so um I mean, you can get that for all phones they just sort of clip on um and you can and you can do it without a lens you can just get really really close to um you know so many um items and, and just make sure that you focus on them um and you can capture all sorts of details that you might not have um, otherwise otherwise seen. Like, I think that's one of the most important things in photography. And it's something that um, one of my friends said to me is that as a photographer, I tend to notice the unnoticed. And it's true, especially in your home, because the things that you live with every day, they might go unseen. They might not be picked up on. And by you photographing it and getting in close and capturing that detail and capturing that moment, you know, that item is always going to be there. You can capture it and you can have that forever. And it can tell a story about you. It can tell a story about your home. Um, and, and part of photography, and especially documentary photography, is about learning to catch what's there and learning to see beyond what you might expect to see. It's learning to actually look. The most important thing is actually looking and trying to look and, and sort of think about where you might want that, that shot to be. And, and how it might be interesting. You know, if you've got a cushion, I'm sure you can take it straight on. But what if you were, you know, to zoom straight in and take it at a different angle? So it's about thinking with, uh, with, you know, about interesting ideas and what might visually look good in the frame. Um, another type of photography that's really fun to do at home is um, garden photography. And obviously this applies to parks as well. So if you're going outdoors for a bit and you want to get, you know, you're getting some fresh air, you're going for your walks. Um, again, that close-up macro photography can be really, really good in um, parks and gardens. So you can take so many photographs of, of flowers just where they are, of trees just where they are, leaves, you know, even grass, insects. You can take birds, animals. And again, you've just got to apply these basics of photography that we um, we discussed before. It's just about thinking, well, if I'm capturing a bird, it's going to be fast. So I need a fast shutter speed. But I need a really wide aperture. And it's just about planning for those things. Maybe I need to be silent. So maybe an SLR isn't the best because it's going to make a noise. You know, it's about sort of planning for those, those sort of eventualities. Um, but something that's really nice is can be capturing that nature and capturing the animals because... I think if there's anything we've learned from 2020, it's a renewed love of, of nature and all things um, sort of uh, in our natural world and realising just how important they are and how much we need to preserve them. And um, one of the ways of sort of increasing that love for it is to actually try and capture it and to try and, um, you know, um, make that memory from it. Because not only are you, you know, being healthy for yourself and, and getting that outdoor experience but you're also um, sort of replicating it in visual form you're appreciating it more because you're looking closer you're looking harder and you're taking more of it in than you might usually um, another form of photography 
did it, you can easily do. You know, you're in lockdown, you're on pandemic, whenever, it is street photography, which is literally getting, you know, out in the street and documenting what you see. Now, there's, a, there's sometimes a bit of a debate about this because, um, you know, people can not, you know, want to be captured and there's issues of copyright and who you can capture and should you ask permission and all that. Now, mostly if it's like a crowd photograph, you know, you can't really make out individuals, then you're not really going to get in uh, in that much um, bother. And, and street photography has a sort of, you know, blurring of those of those lines of what is okay and what isn't. But it can be, you know, especially just for fun, it's one of those most spectacular things of just getting out there and capturing the world around you, capturing where you live, capturing your area. And, you know, that will change. The architecture will change. The people will change. The surroundings will change. And then suddenly you've got a little moment of history in your hands and you've got that documentation. So it's really important um, thing to do to sort of create that legacy. And it's one of the reasons I love documentary photography so much because you're sort of adding to that historical stockpile of you know, visual material. So it's really, really important to have um, for like our longevity of like our memory. There's a few other things you can do at home that are a little bit there's photo challenges. So you go onto Pinterest, you know, you go online, you can even write your own. You will find photo challenges galore. And these are things that might list 1 to 10, 1 to 30. And um, you just work through the list. Like, I think I'm showing you an example here. You just work through the list and you can um, take a picture. So one might be red. You know, you've got to find someone red and photograph it. One might be, you know, me. You've got to find something that represents you or photograph yourself and the idea is that we react to each prompt and you take something for it and that can be a really great way of getting you to think outside the box and to start practicing photography you know if you've not got if you don't know what to photograph in your house you know do use these types of prompts because then you'll be wandering around your house looking for something red you know you can't avoid that and then when you get to it don't take the obvious picture Think of how you can take that picture from different angles, from different viewpoints, you know, think of how you can really take that picture and make it exciting. Um. There's other things you can do, like, um, you know, you can, especially with Christmas coming up, you can use photography to make some really nice gifts. So you can really make presents for your loved ones with, um, with photography and really make it personal. So, you know, there's things like here where I've cut out, um, you know, hand-cut letters and, and posed with them to make a message. Um, that was from a grandma who I'm missing a lot this lockdown. Um, and then, you know, there's things where you can, um, like, make make a story from putting the photographs in sequence um, about, you know, your journey or your day and then putting it all um, into a story of a memory. So, you know, maybe you went somewhere, maybe you did something, maybe you want to capture that. We'll put it in sequence and print it out, you know, so you've got 12 pictures on a page and then you've got it. And you can obviously do scrapbooking. You can do photo transfer. You can put your photographs onto T-shirts, onto, um, you know, um, you know, uh, prints. You, you know, it's really important to actually, you know, do something with your photographs. You know, not just keep them in the computer because at the end of the day, you know, we all end up with so much photos in our phone and our computer and we, how often do we look at them, you know? It's really important to have that sort of physical thing. So, you know, make an album, make a scrapbook, you know, make it up and give it someone. Some of my friends have really loved my presents when I've made a, made a little photo album because it's personal, you know. It takes time to select those photographs and to print them and it means a lot more than, than sometimes than the digital file. And I think, you know, as much as we are not in the, you know, new era we're not we're not in a film era anymore it's all digital but it's really important to sort of preserve that 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 knowledge and that experience and to have that sort of um, tactileness with our um with our printing and with what we do with our photographs um you know again like physical materials last so much longer than 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 our digital counterparts and as i said the digital counterparts will deteriorate so you know you've really got to make sure that how you store your photographs is effective. On that note, things like Instagram and Facebook deteriorate the quality of your photographs. So it's really important to not have them as your only copies of your photograph because, you know, you will not have the best quality photograph in that case and it will deteriorate over time. 
so you know you just you could end up losing your image that way so always make sure you have the original in backup so just to conclude i've been mary and i've been running this workshop um for the young producers festival um i'm a member of young producers but i also have my own little business um called the picture hole um you can find me at www.thepicturehole.co.uk you can find me on Instagram at the picture hole and you can email me info at the picture hole if you have any questions about this workshop and I'll make sure to get back to all those you can comment me or message me on my Instagram um, you can also um, get in touch with the young producers on their Instagram um, and you can also um, visit young producers on their website and their Facebook so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch um, with any of us. And, and, you know, I'll be happy to answer any, you know, questions or reply to any comments. If you do happen to do any of these photography ideas, um, you know, that I've been through today or you're testing your new skills at home, then please feel free to share them with us. I'd love to see them at um, uh, our social media accounts. So... If you do do any of the tasks from today, please share them with us on our social media. You can um, share them with the Young Producers sh social media. If you do any um, of the tasks or any of the introduction to photography outlined today, then um, please feel free to share any of it on social media with us. You can tag Young Producers, you can tag My Little Business, and um, we'd love to see any of the creations that you come up with. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this workshop today. If you've got any questions, please you know, feel free to get in touch. And um, I hope you um, enjoyed the festival so far and I hope you really enjoy the rest of it.